Hi, and welcome to our Bible study. This morning we'll be beginning in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, beginning verse 15. Winding down. It's been an exciting ride, and we still have a lot to do. Entire 13th, well, the rest of chapter 12, and chapter 13 is even more exciting as, as the writer wraps up his letter. I suggest you pray, and, and as you're reading through this, make sure you have your Bible handy when we're going through this, to look at the richness of the information that we're receiving here from God. Thank God he wrote about himself and shared it with us, right? Well, again, thanks for joining us. Have a blessed rest of your day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word that you come together around your word. We thank you for sharing your thoughts and your sharing you with us so that we might get to know you better and be sanctified. This process of sanctification will take the rest of our lives. And then, then and only then, when we're with you, will we fully sanctified. But Lord, we, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for walking with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And through our daily lives as we as we live out this life here in this side of heaven. So be with us today as we talk. Holy Spirit of God, open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us. Uh, and uh, help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. All right. We're beginning on the... Lori, are you able to read this morning? Sure. Okay. Well, let's begin reading verse 15, please. 12, 15? Uh, yeah. Chapter 12, verse 15. Yes. Sorry. Right. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Okay. And and the amplifies says, and the many become contaminated and defiled by it. So bitter root growing up. And again, one of the things that the author of this and throughout the Bible he talks about forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. Um, times are, are not easy um, for anyone. And we are, iron sharpens iron. And sometimes we're just lifting each other up because we're going through the valley, you know. If not the valley of the shadow of death, the valley of despair, or uh, we're in the middle of chastening, which happens, or anything. We do need to lift each other up. And we need accountability. Um, and if you don't have this, uh, it's always good to remind us that we need a brother or a sister to be accountable to. And it could be your wife. It could be uh, uh, anyone just to keep us on the straight and narrow. If, uh, and I love all of you enough, and I, I'm more intimate with Alan and Mike and, and Laurie and, and Katrina. If I see somebody going off the path, I'm going to say something, but it's not going to be a harsh, it's going to be out of love. And that, if you see that with me, I know you guys would do the same thing. And that's important because you can go off on a track and, you know, anything's possible. Anything is possible. So um, we have to also remember as I'm reading this that Gil, my buddy John Gill, um, talks about the fact that we can't lose our grace. If you're saved, if you know Christ as your Savior, you're born again, you can't lose your grace. But he continues as you're going through this, his, his continuing theme has been apostasy, meaning people that have walked up to the edge of Christianity and backed off. Um, and there are people out there today who think they're saved, and unfortunately they're not. Going to be a lot of, I've always said, there's going to be a lot of surprised people in heaven. A lot of Catholics that don't think they've done enough to get there, but they've trusted Christ for they're there. And a lot of people who thought they were good enough to enter heaven, and they're not. So we need to, again, lift each other up and continue to keep us on the narrow path toward our um, sanctification as we go forward. All right. Um, Mike. Um, could you read verses 16 and 17, please? Okay. I, uh, I'd like to point out that in verse 15, please. my Bible 
uh, so see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. I don't know what other people's translations say. Um, I see the NIV said, see that you don't miss. Right. Uh, so that's a little different. Well, that goes along, Mike, with the, the, the um, if you're missing the grace of God means you're, you don't know Christ. Right. And we can't, as a born again believer, we can't lose that grace. We have it. it it's permanent. Praise God. But if you're not saved, then you can come right up to the right up to the edge and back off. Um, so that's the warning, again, by this author. All Give right. Okay. Verse 16. 16 uh, and 17. Okay. That no one is, well, let's see. I'm going to back up a little bit. So root out bitterness. Uh, springs up and causes trouble and by, by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing he was rejected for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears yes um, and again they bring up a person a character from the Old Testament that they all would have known. Um, Jacob and Esau, the, the children of Isaac and Rebekah. Um, Esau was a worldly man and went off to found the nation of Edom, which we know uh, God held in contempt. As, as the Israelites were coming out of uh, slavery in, in Egypt, Edom would not allow them to cross their territory. But again, it all goes back to the root here. Um, he was, the, the term in Hebrew, he was rejected. And that is, the, in the Hebrew means disqualified and set aside. Um, could find no opportunity to repair by repentance what he had done. No chance to recall the choice he'd made, although he saw it carefully with bitter tears. I'm reminded of this warning to those who've been exposed to the faith when I read this. First thing I remember is Isaiah 55, 6, and that is seek, inquire for, and require the, uh, require the Lord while he may be found, claiming him by necessity and by right. Call upon him while he is near. So that's a warning in scripture. If you're feeling close to God, if God is coming to you, don't reject him. Um, and then there are many, again, Esau, there's, I've talked about this before. There's a line that we can cross over if you're not saved. There's a line when God says, okay, that's it, you know. Um, and as we're studying um, on the radio right now, McGee's going through Jeremiah, which is you know, just an uplifting, exciting. We did that here, of course. Uh, time in the scripture about the Israelites. Um, and God said uh, the Israelites were so bad that if Samuel and Daniel and Moses were standing here before me and pleading for the, for the nation of Judah, I would still destroy them. I'd save the three, those three guys. The rest of them would be gone. You know? um, and then uh, the, our Lord in the New Testament, we're talking in Luke chapter 13, verse 24. And that says, strive to enter by the narrow door. and the term that the translators say, and this isn't a translation of the of the Greek, but their their comment on that is, force yourselves through it. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Um, we've all seen or heard of those who heard God's call and rejected it, and tried again later. The door was closed by their own unbelief. There is a time when people, uh, I talk about Pharaoh. Five times, the Bible tells us, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh, and then all of a sudden it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That was it. That was the, the God. That was the line. He crossed that line. So no matter what he did, God would not allow him to repent and to seek what he should be doing. So Romans one verse twenty four is a scary. Therefore. Uh, as an example, uh, Ezekiel 14, 14 and 14, 20. 
illustrates this as well. God would not be turned from the judgment of Israel and Judah. It's scary. Okay, moving along. Katrina, um, can you agree? Uh, we're going to take a chunk here. Verses 18 to 24, please. I'm sorry, Katrina, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. For you have, okay, verses 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burnt with fire, and to the blackness and darkness and the tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who hear is begging that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Verse 20. Well, they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or sh shot with an arrow. Verse 21. And was terrified with the sight that Moses said, I am extremely afraid and trembling. Verse 22. But you have come to the Mount Zion and to the city of the living God heavily Jerusalem to the immortally, I can't pronounce the word, uh, company of angels. Countless multitudes, it says in the Amplified. Go ahead. Yeah. You said to 20 what? To 24. Okay. To uh, verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who were registered in heaven to god the judge of, of all to the spirit of just men made perfect and 24 to jesus the mentor of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling and speaking better things than of abel so again but yeah what the writer here is telling us again in the past, the Jews were under the law, and Mount Sinai, if you recall your story in Exodus, if anything touched the mountain, it was to be destroyed. But no one come near the mountain because God's presence was there. Mount Sinai was a place of lightning and thunder and trembling, and people were literally scared, almost scared to death. Moses himself was trembling. But now, again, we're coming in a different way. We are coming as children, God's children, that we now come with open hearts and open mouths and open arms to our Lord. And he's got his arms open for us to receive us. We're coming to Mount Zion. And this is, again, Sinai, when you read that in the Bible, is always talking about the law. And, of course, Zion is always talking about uh, Christ and his forgiveness and his death, burial, and resurrection, and what that's done for us. So we approach God from Mount Zion. Um, the Jews in pa times past, and people that he's writing to, would have approached from Sinai, thinking that doing the letter of the law would get them saved. And of course, the Pharisees are a famous example of a group of people who did the letter of the law, but missed entirely the love of God and, and, and him himself. So, so yeah, we, we are coming to Mount Zion. So that's good news. That's good news for us. Um, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, the church assembly of the firstborn who are registered as citizens in heaven, and to the God who is judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, the redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfect. We are perfected in Christ. We're not there yet, bodily yet. Now we are being sanctified. We will be perfected when we meet him. So that's again take heart and again this is a plea from the writer of the letter of the hebrews go away from sinai where you're now as a believer you're in zion you're going to mount zion with christ so it's a uplifting trying to trying to make sure that they're turning away from uh the law as the only way of salvation we have a new way and that's through belief in jesus christ all right, Al, um, <clears throat> could you read verse 25, please? See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, 
much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Amen. Amen. So again, in this book, up to now, we've heard this through the entire book of Hebrews, the letter, and warnings after warnings after warning. Don't reject him or refuse to listen to and heed him. Who is speaking to you now? Okay. And again, the warning again, going back, these are Hebrews, these are Jews. For if they, the Israelites, did not escape when they refused to listen and heed him, who warned and divinely instructed them here on earth, revealing with heavenly warnings as well, how much less shall we escape if we reject and turn our backs on him who cautions and admonishes us from heaven? So again, the Jews were rejected. They rejected God. Sorry, you need to get down. It's my good boy. It's my shadow. There you go, buddy. Thank you. Well, little entertainment. See, we have, we have everything in this class. The resemblance is uncanny. <laughs> yeah, I'm about as lucky as he is, too, if you, will, if you believe wow. in that. Anyway. Um, warnings again. Don't reject the faith. Don't turn away from the faith. Uh, don't prove yourselves not of the faith by turning away and going back. Um, to uh, what's going on before, to the law. Uh, I'm listening to big, I'm not sorry, uh, Tim Keller right now is going through the book of Galatians mm -hmm. on his podcast. And he keeps talking about warnings that, that he keeps, uh, Paul, warning the Galatians. Who, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I mean, throughout the, the book, you know? Um, and then, of course, the last three days, he's talked about uh, the Judaizers who came to, to um, Galatia, if you will, to the Galatians and told them they all had to be circumcised. And his Paul is so angry with these false teachers that are trying to get the Jews to go back to the law and have, wait a minute, Christ isn't enough. You have to do this. He says, I wish that these people who are teaching you would emasculate them, go, go all the way and emasculate themselves. Now, emasculate means to uh, uh, remove their male appendage. You know, to take care of it all. That's how angry Paul was. He put that in a letter. Um, that's how angry Paul was at these people who were leading the Jews astray. And here in the Hebrews, again, a warning. Stay, come to Zion. Stay at Zion. Don't go back to Sinai. Uh, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's it. That's He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's not just the author of our faith. So in him, we live and move and have our being. It's it's our, it's who we worship and who opened the door to heaven for us. Glory to God. So again, the warning, um, I'm reminded when I read this in uh, Matthew 19, verses 24 to 26. Uh, and the Amplified reads, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were utterly puzzled, astonished, and bewildered, saying, who then can be saved from eternal death? But verse 26 says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible. With, with God, all things are possible. So again, turn away from Sinai. Turn to Zion. God is waiting. But um, no, I'll digress. God, in verse 22, how is Zion uh, spelled in the Amplified? Z-I-O-N. Yeah, it's interesting. It's actually S-I-O-N here in the uh, King James. Really? Yeah. Didn't know that. You think I'd know that, wouldn't you? I didn't uh, know that. No, no, I think you'd be focusing on the contents, not the spelling, but be that as it may. Well, it's an interesting comment, and it's interesting how the translations have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you read, has anyone ever taken a little bit of time to read the original King James, the 1500 version? It is really different, <laughs> and different, totally different spelling. I mean, like, you got. You have to use. Uh, I don't know. Use all your skills to try and figure out what they're saying because that's the tough, word. That's, that, that's a tough go there when you go to back to those original 
Uh, same thing if you if you look at the Westminster Confession, um, the original version of that, you get the same the old English, and it's it's a tough slug. Mm-hmm. Scott, I, I would uh, I would say with this this whole passage this morning, you know, I, as you he talks about Esau and his refuse or, or trading in his birthright and uh, the refusal of the repentance, um, which we know from Peter that no matter how, you know, repentance is always accepted if it's genuine. It doesn't matter how many times. So, you know, I think the meaning there is that, that Esau wanted the, the gift, if you will, without really repenting. You know what I'm saying? He he wanted the blessing, but he didn't he didn't want to uh, uh, really believe. You know, he just wanted the blessing, and you know, the, and and this author is trying to convince a group of people that they have to give up. You know, the law, the meaning of the law has changed. But if if you mm-hmm. think about it, how long had they followed the law? Fifteen hundred years. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Well, you know, and so both author of Hebrews and the author of you know in Romans, Paul is trying to um, convince them, if you will, that you know Jesus is the way, not not the law. And of course, he's getting some um, pushback because this has been going on for you know a long time, and. Uh, you know, to, to kind of drop something and move on to the next thing is hard. We're not we're not good at that. So no, uh, you, can, you can understand all the uh, uh, you know resistance, if you will, to to the change and uh, all the writing that's that that was done to convince uh, these folks. So yeah, well, Paul Paul himself. I mean, Paul was so. Uh, had such a heart for his fellow Jews, and of course, Paul was. There was no one who was as as uh, dedicated to to uh, the Jewish faith as Paul. I mean, studying he, and he lists his credentials and uh, studied under Gamaliel. We met Gamaliel in the uh, Book of the Acts of the Apostles. You know, um, he was a Jew's Jew, and yet. Uh, his comment is, "I count it now as all as filthy rags, all that all that I did." Um, now these these folks are kind of using his own words against him. I mean, how many times does Paul say to the Jew first, and then then to the Gentile? Uh-huh. And here, as you say, the Judaizers are telling people they have to be circumcised before they can be a Christian. They have to be a Jew first, and then you know so. Um, yeah, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough go for Paul to convince. Um, yeah, some of these, some of well, these. Folks. Let Let's be honest. Um, not all the people in these towns that that he's writing to, some of them thought they were saved and they weren't, and that's the warning that it just Hebrews just bangs that drum over and over and over again um, because of the fear of not meeting the mark not trusting christ trusting in your own stuff my good works um i uh i look what i look you know have i done that many great things for you lord uh did we not uh he cast out demons and heal people in your name and, and the lord says i never knew you the four words you don't want to hear um uh, it's scary and the heart of the apostles, we don't know who wrote Hebrews for sure. R.C. Sproul insists it's uh, Paul, but we don't know. But the heart of the apostles throughout are to get people to trust Jesus fully for their salvation, not themselves. Sinai, you're trusting in yourself if you're just following the law and not getting uh, the faith. It has, salvation hasn't changed. It's always been faith in God. It's always been trusting in God. The law was given to show them that they couldn't meet God's standards. And they had to cry out to God, repent and be saved. Um, And God, Mike, to your point, 
God's always waiting. And again, that picture in the in the uh, parable of the prodigal son just moves me to tears. The father is waiting at the window every day, looking for that son to come down the road. He's waiting. He's waiting for us to repent, come to him, and he'll save us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's uh, it's heartening, but it's scary to, because of why this was written the way it was and why Rome was written the way it was, because many of the Jewish faith, and let's be honest, of the Gentile faith, are trusting in the mass or the uh, the communion or uh, extreme unction at the end of their life to thinking it's, it's all going to be okay. And it's not a work of man, it's a work of God. It's all Jesus, all Jesus, not Scott, and not anyone else. Well, wow. good stuff today. Um, let's move on, if that's okay. Uh, Becky, would you read 26 to 28? <clears throat> At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Mm. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Mm, that's verse 29. We'll do 29 in just a second. Oh, sorry about that. No, that, that's okay. It's, it's uh, one of those incredible passages in scripture um again things that can be shaken now you this was written 50 60 a.d uh revelation has not taken place yet the book of revelation is not written by john yet but we know reading revelation that everything will be shaken again and it'll be a final shaking i mean the stars are falling out at you think, think of the pictures of revelation that we receive from john the stars are coming out of the heavens. Um, earthquakes and hail the size of pianos. Uh, everything's being torn apart. Um, as MacArthur says, you know, if you guys, you environmentalists think we're ruining the earth, wait do you see what my boss does, you know? When the final judgment of God falls on the earth and everything is shaken. Uh, that's a scary time. But again, the author here is calling on us to hang on to what won't shake that's god god's not shakable god's word isn't shakable god's word will never pass away um it's incredible i mean so hang on you know the, everything and the, the call for us not to rely on our money or our talents but trust in god for the real treasure the real mccoy the real thing is what God has given us, our salvation in Jesus Christ. And that lasts forever. Um, the money I have in the bank will mean nothing uh, the second that I pass from this earth. It's all, I mean, it's all gone. The only thing I'm going to have is what I stock I bought, if you will, in heaven. And I couldn't pay for it myself. It's been paid for for me. Uh, and all the works that we perform here, teaching. Uh, living our lives as an example to others is done by the power of Christ. It's not our own power that does it. Um, acknowledging that is really something we have to do and take no credit for ourselves. Um, again, reject the old covenant. Sinai was shaken and God's going to shake it again. Hang on to what won't shake loose and that's God. And uh, verse 29, it's my turn to read. So I get to read this. For our God is indeed a consuming fire. And this is a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, which reads in the Amplified, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And of course, consuming fire, we think about the jealousy of God, and that's it's written about what does that mean? Well, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. He's free. In, in the first commandment, Exodus 20, 
Um, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment, because God admits and tells us again here, he is a jealous God. He is a consuming prayer. So we are to put our faith, trust, and hope in him. Not in ourselves, in him. Not in any idols that we might have. Our, I said earlier, our money, uh, our jobs, our power, whatever power we might have here, this side of eternity means nothing. Our relationship with God is the premier thing. It's the thing we have to center on and put first in our lives. Um, and that's not always easy. Let's admit, we've got the cares of this world, the sick people we take care of, um, our own illnesses, our own shortcomings, they're all, cons they're consuming as well. They can, they can be. And they, you can, if you're not careful, you can build everything on what's happening this here. But again, the writer here is warning us, look up, go to, go to Zion. Forget about Sinai. Uh, as far as you're not going to be saved there, you're going to be saved at Mount Zion. Do what Jesus did on the cross. Um, and again, Gil, and you, if you read my uh, read my notes here, I've, I've quoted John Gill on this verse. Talks about the, the Shekinah glory of God, um, how Moses wanted to see God. And God says, if you look at my face, no one can look at my face and live. Okay. But I'll tell you what, I'll put you in the crick of a rock. I'll walk by and you can see my back parts, you know. Um, we And again, what I said earlier about the holiness of God, we forget how holy God is. And it's easy to do, sadly, for me. But I, he reminds us that God is indeed a jealous God, he's a consuming fire, he is God. So, God, my, my last comment on this as we finish chapter 11 is he will utterly destroy those who refuse to worship him, but there will be a wall of fire in our defense against those who would malign or misuse us. That's what it talks about here. Consuming fire works two ways. Consuming fire is okay. You're not worshiping God. You don't trust me. You're you're hey, you're toast. But there's also a wall of fire that God puts up for those who love Him. Those who would come against us will meet God's consuming fire, if not here, in the hereafter. So we serve a jealous God. And there's a song that was out several years ago that we sang on Saturday nights. He is jealous for me. And he is jealous for us. He loves us with a consuming fire. That's how much he loves us. He sent his son to die for us. Who would do that? Only God. Only God. And Jesus willingly went to the cross. Did he have some, did he have some second thoughts just before it happened? Yes, somebody says, yes, he did. God did. Jesus was fully human, but he was also fully God. And he knew it was going to happen to him. Uh, and, and no one would no one would have uh, said anything if he turned away. He could have. He could have, but he didn't because he loves us that much. And again, for the sake of the prize, God's calling on us to go to, go to Mount Zion, go to Christ. That's where our salvation is. Not in the law. Not in all the rules and regulations. It's Christ in Christ. That's, any comments before we finish chapter uh, 11 and move on to 12? I think we finished 12, right? We're moving on to 13. Oh, 13. Thank you very much, Mike. I'm trying to back this up here, Scott. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have a truck. Yes. All right. So we'll We're move on to Sunday morning. What's that? We're doing enough of that Sunday morning, apparently, <laughs> backing up. So we need to. Keep, keep moving forward moving forward yes and All again right. beg to differ we actually moved forward five verses this week <laughs> barely <laughs> now as, as we come into chapter 13 this is the typical i say typical paul does this at the end but here the writer to the hebrews 
takes a whole chapter to basically go over everything he's talked about and throw in a few more zingers um, of things we need to do as, as uh, Christians, um, what we need to do to live our lives for Christ. Um, there's final thoughts, exhortations, and of course, greetings. And interesting, at the end of the chapter, he's, uh, these people knew him, whoever wrote this. Um, Paul always signed his, his name in one case. He said, it's written with my own hand. I'm signing with my own hand. Um, but this is a, the communication with these Jewish believers. And again, as we begin, um, let's start with uh, Lori. If you read chapter 13, verse number one. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Okay. Uh, in the Amplified, it reads, Let love for your fellow believers continue and be a fixed practice with you. Translators note, never let it fail. Um, it's one of our Lord's commands. Um, emphasize, the one that he emphasized the most throughout his teaching is that we love his followers love one another. Um, John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, and then the translators know, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. So again, we're commanded to love one another, uh, to hold each other up, to hold each other accountable. Now, love is not all... Uh, violins and... Uh, champagne. Well, sometimes love is a uh, swift kick in the pants to get us back on the road where we need to be. Um, one of the, and you think about love, again, one of the things that uh, we have to be careful of as we're talking about loving one another, if we see uh, one of the worst things we could do to a fellow believer is not tell them they're on the wrong path and get them back on the path. And, and also, Think about it, one, the, the hatred, showing hatred to those who aren't of the faith is not telling them that there is a, a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. That's the other thing that you think about hatred uh, and about not loving someone. Not telling someone the truth is a scary thing. It, it move us forward to witness to our relative and friends that they that they have that relationship with christ that we have i agree with you scott but sometimes as some christians they like to point out people's failures instead oh. of you know you're supposed to come in love with it just like you said with correction but the way oh yeah you did such and such and it's the way you de deliver it to a person and the way you come at a person it should be loving, just like it says, not to be saying, you know, it in in a negative way. Well, and one of the Scott Bowmanisms I've always had is there's at least 10 different ways to sell, tell someone to go to hell, and one or two of them mm -hmm. kind of make look forward to the trip, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Right. It's, again, we, we're to speak in love, not just to speak out of anger or avarice or anger. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want us to speak out of anger. God can speak out of anger to us. He does not. He speaks to us in love. Yeah. That's the mm -hmm. litmus test. I mean, John 13, 35. That's how people will know that you are my disciples is Amen. your love for one another. So all the other stuff, yeah, it's all important. But at the end of the day, and I mean, how important is that with all the craziness that's going on right now? We have a, we have a very great opportunity to demonstrate that. Um, and I don't remember God saying, just love the ones that you choose to love. I think it's a love everybody always, regardless of what their, you know, whatever their political, whatever. It, it's, um, you know, I don't remember it being a request from God. I think it was. Well, a command, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so. Verse, two, verse two really brings us, uh, brings up what you just said, Becky. Uh, Mike, would you read verse two? <laughs> Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Okay, and the, the most famous example of that, I'm going to read Genesis 18, verses 1 through 5. 
Now think about this, okay? Um, Abraham's sitting by his tent under the flat because it's it's hot, and uh, off in the distance he sees um, he sees people and, and reads. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks or terebinths of Marmre as he sat in the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men stood a little distance from him. He ran from the tent floor to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. And he said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant, I beg of you. Will a little water be brought that you may wash your feet and recline and rest yourselves under the tree? And I will bring a morsel as a mouthful of bread to refresh and sustain your hearts before you go on further. For that is why you have come your servant. And they replied, do as you have said. Again, commandment the loved one. He didn't know these were angels. These were common guys, three men walking. And of course, if you read further in the story, one of them departs and there's only two. And there's a whole conversation <clears throat> that God has, should we let Abraham know? But the point is, to show that to the stranger, to show the stranger comfort and give such comfort as we can. Um, love one another, you know, a hallmark of love for Christ and love everyone and show love to everyone. Um, if you recall, one of the things that people didn't believe back when Jesus was on the cross and that people cited for why they believed in Christianity, um, people that were present at the cross. One of the things, if you remember, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, the last thing a Roman soldier or the people that are jeering at Jesus would have expected Jesus to say is, Father, forgive them. Um, you know, if I were on the cross, I'd be calling down fire from heaven on them, you know. Open up the ground and suck them down like uh, the sons of Corinth, right? But Jesus, again, commands us to love as we've been loved. And how many times have I tripped and fallen, uh, not physically, but spiritually? And God's allowed me to get, God picked me up and repented and fellowship reestablished. But we, again, are commanded to love, just like Becky said. Uh, we don't just love Republicans and we don't just love Democrats. We don't just love conservatives. We love one another. And then we're... To your point, Becky, we're in an extremely divisive time right now. I mean, there are people you know, that are one have one persuasion or the other, and they're uh, to the point where uh, people aren't getting along. I mean, viciously getting along. But again, the command to us is to love one another. Therefore, be an example. You said that right. It is. It's very difficult because. Me and my brother, he was he calling me, telling me that about Biden and everything, because I haven't really been watching the news and because he thought he should um, get out, get out too and everything. So I was like, oh, OK, but I don't want to hear it. I don't want to. It ain't like I got my head in the cloud or nothing like that. But I keep saying that God knows what's best and the people in Congress. We supposed to pray for him. But whoever is supposed to be there is God's will. And we, just like you said, we have to pray for one another. And um, last night when I was on my way to Bernard's, I went to stop to get something to eat. And it was a young man and he was saying, miss, and I knew he was going to say, uh, could he get something? Um, but he said he needed something to eat. And I said, okay, you want something to eat? I'm going to buy you some food. And he said, for real? And I said, yeah, so I took him in the restaurant and I said, you could buy whatever you want to eat. And he said he wanted one hot dog. I said, you sure you want one hot dog? And, I, and then I said, no, you can have two hot dogs. And he said, for real? I said, yeah, I get French fries and a drink. And he was so thankful. And sure. I thought about, you know, what it was saying, because God, a lot of people be like, all oh, these young people, they uh they need to be out here working and everything. But I said, God put me there for a purpose to feed that young man. And I did what oh. God said to do. And um, it, it just made me feel good just to see. He he was so thankful to have something to eat. Amen. That's And that's exactly what uh, the writer of the Hebrew here is talking about. Mm -hmm. Who knows? There's a 
couple of good movies out there that uh, uh, let me remember here uh, the worldly one where uh, it's Nicolas Cage and he's living he's a uh, high paid executive does the big deals living in sin but at one time he's going to go into the ministry and he abandoned that and uh well he meets this guy and this again this is hollywood but he meets this guy and this guy is an angel he doesn't know it and the guy he helps the guy out the guy's getting held up and he talks the guy out out of harming this person and uh he says you know he gives him a, a chance to go and live the life that he quote unquote should have lived as a in the ministry and doing this and it's a, a great story but we don't know who we're entertaining we don't know we are to love one another and be uh if someone needs a meal we need to help them out you know if we have the means to do it that's why god the money's not ours you know i said one second after i'm gone the money the, all the money we have is, means nothing uh what's going to last is uh, what we've done for christ in his name by his command and through his help so all right we'll finish there for today it's now going on seven o'clock um becky could you pray for us today please as we go out lord we love you we thank you that you're large and in charge uh we thank you that you are the true hope of the world um just as you say in your word trouble today trouble tomorrow this is nothing new um it's just the fact that we have access to hearing about it much much more than we did before um but again lord we know that you are the one person to whom everyone needs to turn so we pray that whatever it takes um that people will see their need for you um as scott said at the end of the day what matters is what has been done for you nothing else all the rest of it just goes away pray that um as our dear friend Lori has said so many times before that we would reflect the love of Jesus in all that we do and say and think and those we meet today um, and that uh, we would never lose sight or stop being thankful for the incredible gift of prayer and being able to talk to you, the king of the universe at any time of the day. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, everyone. Great Bible study this morning. Look forward to next week. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right-hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on Giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.